right. All right, we're going to go ahead. There we go, and get started. Uh, one second. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, so today, um, Derek and I are going to be talking about some of our adventures in Alaska. We went to Alaska this past June, um, so early in the summer, early June, for about two weeks. Um, we did want to shout out um, our third birding buddy, Lee J. Graphius. Um, even though he's not helping with this presentation, he was definitely there and took a lot of pictures. So we did include some of those. All right. Right. So um, you can see uh, each of these little spots are places that we entered uh, eBird lists from in Alaska. Um, and as we zoom in, we'll, uh, we'll show you various places that we went. We focused on four main areas, um, all in the mainland. We went to uh, Nome and then up to Utkivik and then back down to Seward in the peninsula south of Anchorage and then kind of the heart of Alaska there around Denali. Okay, so for our, our first stop was in Nome. Um, so zooming in to Alaska, here we have Alaska. And then Nome is on the Seward Peninsula here, this, this whole cluster of eBird hotspots. So just zooming in there. So the town of Nome is actually right here. And then you can see that we kind of went um, to several far-flung areas around Nome. So these are just some photos of the snowy mountains on our way from Anchorage to Nome. Right, and then, um, so like Hannah said, Nome is located on the southern portion of the uh, Seward Peninsula along the Norton Sound of the Bering Sea. Um, reasons that uh, you guys might know Nome without birding is that it's, it's quite famous for gold in the Iditarod. Um, the reason that Nome exists as a city is basically because of the gold rush uh, right around the turn of the century. And it was at one point the biggest uh, city in Alaska and that's why there are so many decent roads um, going to uh, the outlying areas from, from Nome is basically due to the gold rush and, and all the mining camps and stuff that were, that were out there. Um, the Iditarod back in the 1920s, uh, there was a diphtheria outbreak and they, they brought the medicine in from Anchorage um, via dog sled. And that's, that route is basically retraced every year in the Iditarod sled dog race. For comparison, um, there's about 3,600 people living in Nome, uh, about the size of Weston, West Virginia. But when you looked at uh, the eBird map that we showed, there are roads that go about 70 miles in, in all three directions. So it's, it's quite a, a big place for, um, for a just a town of 3,600. Um, and there are three main birding routes that we'll, that we'll talk about. And, each route in Alaska is basically um, uh, named from the, the destination and the start of the point. Um, so we'll go to like Nome Teller or Nome Council and stuff like that. And those will all be like little towns where um, the road starts and the road ends. So these are shots from the plane. You can see that uh, the main area of Nome is pretty small here. Uh, it does have a nicely developed uh, little harbor um, that was done initially for um, uh, the gold rush, and then uh, the military helped develop it for uh, access um, when they were here. Um, in the second pane, you can see the Nome River as it heads out toward Norton Sound to the Bering Sea, and you can see the little little bridge there where actually was going to be our first stop after we landed. So yeah, so we we landed in the afternoon, and so we spent the the afternoon, early evening, um, just doing a short little foray out. Um, so starting in Nome, we stopped by the Nome River mouth. There's a little bridge there um, near a, a, a fishing village. Um, we continued down down the coast, stopped by Cape Nome, which is this little 
protrudence right here. And then um, made it all the way to Safety Sound Bridge. There's a bridge right here um, before heading back. So the first bird we saw, or one of the uh, first birds we saw, we stopped at the Gnome River mouth, like I said, um, and a notable bird was the bar-tailed godwit. So that's pictured here. So here we have a picture of Derek and me. Derek's looking through a scope, which is like a telescope for birds. Right, just just something that gives you more higher power than than your binoculars or a camera will, so. Yep, so you saw um, bar-tailed godwit, which is notable because within North America, they're only found breeding in the summers in Alaska. Um, so the birds in Alaska are primarily wintering in Australia and New Zealand. So they undertake these, these incredible migration journeys. Um, and just a few weeks ago, a juvenile bar-tailed godwit flew for 11 days and one hour straight without stopping, covering 8,425 miles. So coming going from Alaska all the way to the Australian state of Tasmania, again, without stopping, just a, a constant flight. And that actually set a new world record for marathon, marathon bird flights. So it was very recently ha happened. And then as we continued on, we saw a moose, so that was cool. And then some of the um, fairly commonly encountered birds that we that we saw and heard were included northern water thrush and great cheeked thrush. Um, and the great cheeked thrush was cool because we do sometimes get them in migration in West Virginia, but usually associated with trees and forest. And out on the tundra, there are no trees or forest. Um, so we were seeing them in a lot of scrubby area, which was kind of a different um, habitat than we're used to seeing them. Yeah, and similar for the northern water thrush too, like these birds were, were everywhere. And usually in West Virginia, we see them in high, like boggy areas that have these this still moving water. Um, these guys up in Alaska around them could really be seen anywhere. There's a lot of wet spots because of the tundra and the melting, um, you know, snow and stuff like that. But um, there were no obvious bogs or streams and stuff like that where there were these guys were necessarily encountered. And then likely the most common bird that we encountered in Nome was the Lapland longspur pictured here. Um, so here we have two adult males and then a female. Um, so they were singing, they were displaying all over the place. Um, we were frequently seeing them along the edges of the roads, but we'd also see them just in the middle of the tundra. So they were everywhere. Um, we quickly got used to their song after trying to figure it out. Um, but yeah, very commonly seen bird during our trip. Um, keeping going, keep going down the coast, um, we saw this random juvenile common myrrh just hanging out on some ice on one of the beaches. So just took a picture of that because it was cool. <laughs> okay, and so our first full day in Nome, uh, each day we tried to do one of the three main routes that we were there. Um, and we settled on the Kugarak Road um, for the first one. And that's the one that um, is going to go straight north. So like I mentioned before, these are usually um, named by uh, where they start and where they end. So the official name for this road is like the Nome Taylor Highway. And Taylor is an old mining camp um, that has since been a ghost town. So the, the road actually stops at the Kugarok Bridge. So that's why it's, everybody knows it as the, as the Kugarok Road now in Nome. And these are, this is a, just a typical view of what you'll see. Um, the road was a dirt road, but really well maintained in my opinion, much better than some of the roads that we drive here, even in Morgantown, um, you know, 70 miles into the brush or whatever, and it, it wasn't quite that at all. But this is uh, what you look at. Most of the, um, the roads follow rivers, um, and you can see the evidence of mining camps and, and old dredges and stuff like that along. But you'll see these, these small willow thickets and alder thickets and stuff like that right along the river. So one of the first birds we saw um, heading out Kugarok Road was just a random unexpected short eared owl that was up on a hill that I actually spotted um, while we were driving. Um, and then another bird we saw was the willow ptarmigan, and it was just it was just sitting on the roof of a shed um, early in the morning. And that was actually D um, Derek's and Lee J's first willow ptarmigan, um, so a bird lifer, as we say. 
And then just a, uh, we saw another Willow Termigan. So this is a, a, a different one, um, just sitting, standing in the in the road um, near the edge. And fun fact about Willow Termigan, they are the state bird of Alaska. And in Nome, they were just commonly seen along the roads while driving. At one of the places that we stopped to scan and listen for birds, we heard the song of one of our target songbirds and eventually spotted this little guy in the shrubs. And so this is the Arctic warbler. And although it is called a warbler, it's unrelated to all the other warbler species that occur in North America. So all our Eastern warblers, it's not related to them. Um, our Eastern warblers are, are, are warblers in the United States, belong to the family Perulidae. Um, but this bird belongs to the Eurasian leaf warbler family, Philoscopidae, and it's the only species in its family that breeds in North America. So they breed in, in just Alaska within North America, and then they migrate across the Bering Strait to winter in Southeast Asia. So this was a cool bird and definitely one of our targets to get on this trip. Yeah, and this was one of the ones we weren't sure if it was going to have arrived in Nome, uh, yet by the time we were there, we got to Nome in early June, and just two or three days before that, that's when they started to appear, and everybody started to report them from Kugarak and Council and stuff like that. So these birds are fresh arrivals from Southeast Asia, either overnight or within the past week from where we're seeing them. And some other fairly common birds that we saw included Wilson's warbler, which is pictured on the left, um, Wilson's snipe, which is that top right bird. Um, we were hearing them everywhere. They were calling. Um, we didn't always see them because they they are um, mostly on the ground in wet areas, um, but we were hearing them everywhere. We finally got this guy popping up and just sitting on a rock and sunning and napping. Um, and then that bottom right photo is green winged teal, a small little duck, and we just saw him in a stream along the road. And then again, we encountered another willow term again. Um, we made a quick stop at the Salmon Lake campground along Cougar Rock Road. Um, you can see there were still little patches of snow. And you can note that um, willow ptarmigans and the other ptarmigan species, they have very feathery legs and feet, and that helps to protect from the cold as they're walking around in the snow. So um, the main target for Cougar Rock Road is um, this random uh, round hilltop that people call Coffee Dome. and uh, you can really only identify it by watching your mile markers on your car as you go in. And once you hit like mile marker 72 or whatever it is, there's a very small trail um, that you can easily miss, which we did initially, um, that leads up this, um, this, this round flat topped ridge. And the reason that, that we go up there is for one of the birds that Hannah's gonna talk about later. And it's pretty much the only place that you can find easily this bird breeding in North America easily accessible. Um, I think it was only, they only really found this, this place in the 1980s. Bird tours have been coming to Nome for a long time. Um, and really only that in the 1980s, they finally figured out where these guys are actually nesting. And this is a, a typical view of the rocky tundra that we're seeing. You can see the road um, in the uh, background of the upper right there. But this is the habitat that we're looking in. It's all very low, very scrubby, and easy to miss birds when you're just standing there with binoculars and scanning. Also, it's very treacherous because there's just random little potholes full of water. And so you have to really be careful while you're trekking through this habitat. Um, but our target bird was the bristol side curlew. So that's, here we have a picture. I'm crouched trying to take a picture of it. There's Derek. Um, so I did manage to take, these are like my only two good photos um, of bristle-thighed curlew. And so this is a pretty rare enigmatic bird. Um, it was discovered wintering on South Pacific Islands in 1769. But as Derek was saying, its nesting grounds weren't found until almost 180 years later in the late 1940s. Um, and it's now known to nest in a few hilly areas of Western Alaska. And like Derek said, Coffee Dome is probably the only accessible, reliable breeding location for like birders to go see this bird. So we definitely were sure to make that trip. Here's Derek's much more beautiful photo. Um, 
of the bristle-fied curlew. Yeah, you can easily see um, for the birders in the group um, how this bird could be mistaken for a wimbrel, which we did initially, um, because these birds will will often fly around and do display flights, and sometimes they're like a half mile away, and they look pretty similar. But you'll see, like uh, you can see the the bristles on the thighs here. Um, but the main difference that we're looking for is the tail configuration, the color and the banding of the tail. That's the easiest way to say that you've got a bristle thighed curlew and not a wimbrel. Luckily, when we were on top of the ridge there, uh, looking at one, another one came in and flew right over us, giving it its distinctive call, which was pretty cool while we were up there um, looking for it. So we we definitely knew that we uh, we had one when it landed, unlike that wimbrel that we chased for a half mile over the ridge. Okay, and our second day after we uh, uh, drove the, the Cougarock Road, we went to uh, the western end of uh, the, the Seward Peninsula there and up to a, a, a town called Teller. Now Teller is um, uh, just a small village that's, that's basically the, just the end of the road here. So what you're watching now is one of the first birds that we saw on um, our trip out to the Teller Township. And this is another willow ptarmigan. And what you'll see him doing is um, doing a dust bath is what we call it. So these birds will, will lie and kick up uh, dirt and gravel. And sometimes, especially the grouse will peck up uh, small bits of, of gravel to, to do in their crops so they, they help digest. But the reason this bird is doing uh, a dust bath is, is for health reasons. Um, they get the dust on their feathers and any excess oil is um, like absorbed by the dust and the dust is easily shake, shaken off. And when the dust comes off, a lot of times the parasites will come with it. So that's really a health thing that it's doing, um, uh, just, just bathing in the dust there. So we made a couple of stops. Um, some fairly common birds that we saw included the fox sparrow, which is in two of these photos, and golden crown sparrow. And for the fox sparrow, um, just as a note, we do get fox sparrows in the winter here in West Virginia, and this is the same color morph that we see. Um, so these guys will breed up in Alaska, but they will kind of filter down um, and pass by us in West Virginia. So that's cool. Um, so one of our main stops was at this just random rock formation called Cabin Rock. Um, we were looking for northern wheat ear. We failed to find northern wheat ear, um, but the rock formation was cool, I guess. <laughs> um, so I was excited by some non-bird animals. So this is an arctic ground squirrel that we saw along the road and that um, Derek was kind enough to stop and let me photograph. <laughs> um, so Arctic ground squirrels, they're the only species of ground squirrel in Alaska, and they're the largest and most, nor most northern of the North American ground squirrels. And being in Alaska, they do spend seven to eight months in hibernation because they can't get through the winters without that. So one of the cool things that you can see is along these roads here, sometimes you'll have um, bank erosion and you can see exposed layers of the permafrost. Permafrost has been um, a big topic in um, you know, conservation news, ecological news recently due to its um, function in, in like sequestering carbon. So um, you have this, this frozen layer that is sometimes just feet below the surface. Sometimes it's you know, hundreds of feet below the surface, but where you have these streams uh, coming up and eroding the bank, you can actually see what uh, is under the ground um, in this nice thick layer of, of permafrost that was um, visible to us when we were uh, traveling by the road. And then um, at that same spot where the permafrost was, we got one of our target species, the Eastern Yellow Wagtail. Um, so this is a mostly Asian species. In North America, it's only found breeding in Alaska. And we think, or Science shows that um, birds from Alaska are probably wintering mostly in the Australasian region, so down by Australia and Southeast Asia. So this is one of our targets because we can only get them in Alaska. And then um, 
we did see a bunch of sandpipers. So these are shorebirds um, and they breed away from the shore. So they're not always found on the shore um, despite their name. And so this Western sandpiper popped out just a few feet away from me in the tundra grasses while we were searching for rock charm again. So I immediately stopped my search <laughs> and took photos of this little Western sandpiper. So this was our uh, big target um, for this little area. It's like, I think it's called 37 or 38 mile ridge um, on the road to Teller. Basically what you do is, is you, you make sure you rent a four wheel drive vehicle um, from the, gnome, the only place in Nome that you can rent cars and drive up this gravel road on the top of, uh, of a ridge and very, very slowly keep scanning for this, this bird that's supposed to be nice and white and easy to find and definitely was not. Um, we only found this guy going down the hill after we drove about a mile along this ridge top um, where I was lucky enough to spot him while he was walking. I don't think if he was just sitting still, I would have spotted him because he just he uh, blends in surprisingly well um, to the tundra, despite the fact that he's got this red patch over his eye and he's he's mostly white. Um, so we did we stopped, we got out. We lost sight of him briefly. We were tramping around, um, but eventually refound him. Um, and here he's illustrating something that was that we were also encountering. And that would be mosquitoes. So you can see there's a mosquito just feasting on his face. Um, and they were doing the same to us. I was actually wearing a bug net because I don't like bugs. Um, and I did not want mosquitoes in my face. Um, but yeah, there is the tundra has a lot of mosquitoes, um, and especially this this patch of the tundra. And then here I took um, actual nice photos without the mosquito on his head. Um, so just a fun fact about rock ptarmigans. They look very different in the summer and winter, um, but their timing is, is different than the willow ptarmigan, which we had seen. Um, so male rock ptarmigans are still in their white winter plumage in early June, which is when we were there. Um, their summer plumage is pretty much, it's very cryptic, very camouflaged, a mottled brown color that lets them just blend into the tundra and the grasses. Um, so luckily they were still all white, but um, what's interesting about rock ptarmigans is you can see, you can see here that the, it's white feathers, but they're pretty kind of dirty looking. And that's actually on purpose. So they intentionally dirty their, their snowy white feathers um, simply to better disguise themselves from predators until they molt and replace their feathers, um, which would be later in June, so later in the month. Yeah, and another interesting thing is um, we know this guy's a male because the females have already molted and they're in that really cryptic brown marbled plumage that makes them extremely tough to find. So it's the males that retain their white plumage much longer than the females. That's why they have to get dirty to camouflage themselves. And this was um, Lee Jay's last game bird lifer in North America. So that was a nice accomplishment. And then on the way out, we saw Willow Term again. Um, we saw quite a few of those. He was just posing in a nice little willow bush, um, just sitting and posing prettily. So here's some more pictures that I took. And then um, here we have a video of him just as he was taking off. And so listen carefully to the noise he makes because it's very funny sounding. So yeah, it's just a really weird little chortle sound. Um, it never fails to make me laugh. And then we saw muskox. Um, so this was my, I think all of our first sightings of muskox. Um, these are large creatures that are native. They were native to Alaska, um, but they were extirpated. So locally extinct by the 1920s and then really intensive reintroduction efforts started taking place in 1930. So just about 10 years after they, they officially went extinct in the state. And they actually transplanted muskox, transplanted muskox from Eastern Greenland. Um, so all of the muskox in Alaska today have, can trace their lineage back to those Eastern Greenland um, muskox. 
And so just more muskox photos. Um, they were literally right by the road, as you can see, and there was a whole herd of them just outside Teller. Um, so that was cool. Here we have a video of them running. Yeah, and in the background, you'll see a long spit and on the other side, another spit coming to the south. So what we're looking at um, on your left-hand side there is the Teller spit. Um, and on the right is what a small um, village called Port Clarence. So just like we talked about Nome being a, a town that was uh, founded basically by um, uh, Gold Rush people, um, Teller is a, a small village of about 200, 250 people that's purely sub, uh, subsistence hunting. Um, so this was one of probably the smallest group of, uh, of native peoples that we saw. Whereas on the other side of this bay, the spit in Port Clarence was founded uh, by Swedish missionaries um, uh, right around the turn of the century. So the spits are only just a couple of hundred yards apart, but there's no way to get there when the, uh, when the water's up aside from traveling by boat. Um, so you'd have to actually take an airplane from Nome to Port Clarence if you wanted to uh, the people in Teller to visit there if they didn't have the boat. And then the main reason that we went all the way to Nome, or sorry, all the way to Teller from Nome, um, was to find white wagtails. Um, so these guys are widespread and abundant in Europe and Asia, but there's a very small, very localized population during the summer in Western Alaska. Um, so we managed to spot two little white wagtails in Teller, um, and it was a lifer species for me. <laughs> And then on the way out, um, we did get one just kind of random Says Phoebe pictured here in the town. Um, and then on the way out, we were traveling um, along rivers and we would frequently see little Harlequin ducks, um, which is interesting because in the winter in the, on the East Coast, we only see them in the winter um, along rocky shores, but they breed on rivers. Um, so we got to see them on their breeding grounds. So this is just another typical view of the tundra. So it's very brown, actually, um, brown, yellowish, kind of no trees, obviously, but just a, a scenic view. And then we went back to um, the Cabin Rock site because that we Derek had seen blue throats while I was searching up high for northern wheat ears and getting my shoes soaked by the snow. Um, so we went back because I wanted a good photo of a blue throat. And so here I have a couple of photos. And then I have this interesting photo I caught of a blue throat skylarking. Yeah, so one of the interesting things about a lot of these um, birds in the, in the far north of Alaska is that for their mating display flights, um, they'll actually do skylarking. So we think of like our local uh, songbirds and things like that as just perching on a shrub or high in a tree to announce um, that this is my territory and, and stuff like that. But there aren't that many trees as the, the um, photos have shown. So what these guys will do is um, they'll fly up and start singing this beautiful skylarking song um, as they uh, swirl around and slowly come down. And you actually find quite a variety of, of species that'll do this. Um, like the weed ears do this, the, the blue threads do this, but then when you get up into the uh, even farther north, like the shorebirds will do this as well. Um, even things like semi-palmated sandpipers and pectoral sandpipers that we heard uh, and we'll show you coming up um, also do this skylarking behavior. And Lapland longspurs, every time that we stopped, um, we heard Lapland longspurs singing and then you, if you stay long enough, you'll see them doing their little skylarking display flights really a neat experience uh, coming from West Virginia where you just don't see it. So here we have um, a blue throat singing its song. And then the reason we wanted to, this was one of our target species. Um, 
So it's only, again, in the United States, it's only found in Alaska. Um, so one of our Alaska targets. And they winter in Asia. So they're coming over, breeding in Alaska, wintering in Asia. Um, and they're, they're one of the species where the bulk of their global population breeds in Western Europe and Northern Asia. So most of them are not on this continent. And then there's just a few that come to Alaska to breed. And here's Derek's very beautiful photo of a blue throat. So the third day in Nome, uh, we decided to head out um, the third route that we go. And this one heads east uh, along the coast for a bit and then turns inland. Um, it's called the Council Road because like everything else, um, there was a small mining village at the end of the road called Council. Uh, it's pretty much a ghost town now and you can't uh, get to it all the way. Um, but that was uh, the third day. So here we have a video of, we stopped at the Gnome River Mouth and got um, this little video of Aleutian Turns. So Aleutian Turns, um, they are frequently associated with Arctic Turns, which is pictured in this upper corner. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> this upper corner. This is an arctic tern, and then these two are Aleutian terns. You can tell with that white forehead and black bill, as opposed to black on the head and reddish bill. Um, so interesting about thing about the Aleutian tern is they may be Alaska's most imperiled seabird, um, because they're, the known population of Aleutian terns in Alaska has declined more than 90% since 1960, and that's the fastest decline of any seabird, seabird species in the state. So we were Glad to get them and see them while we can. <laughs> and then here's Derek's photo of the Aleutian turn. And then we did we did see muskox again. So here we have a, a little baby muskox up on the hill. Um, you might have noticed on the map, but there's a lot of water along this route, especially the first part of it. Um, so we had the the sea to one side to the south, and then um, we were passing Safety Sound, which is this large body of water, of fresh water, um, to the north of the road. And so we, of course, saw a lot of waterfowl and water birds. So here we have three different duck species. We have um, northern shovelers, we have a northern pintail, and then we have two long-tailed ducks flying in tandem. But a lot of water, a lot of water birds. So, um... Right toward the um, middle of the route to, to Council was a small mining village called Solomon. Um, and we were lucky enough to arrive there when emperor geese were still around. We weren't sure um, if emperor geese were going to be able to be seen on this trip. Usually most of them have migrated through Nome um, by this point. These two look like they might have been on territory, so they might have been um, settling in. But this was a, uh, a good sighting, one that we, we weren't sure that we were going to get. Um, this, this little spot is by a bridge that's called the Train to Nowhere. And literally, there's just a, a steam engine still sitting there right next to the, the Solomon Bridge. Um, whenever the gold rush was going on, they built these uh, railroads to, to bring the gold into to Nome to, to put on the boats to take out. And they just left this, this train here. So uh, literally the locals just call it train to nowhere because it, it can't go anywhere. And you can see in this picture that these, these two small geese here just had their, their heads sticking up. So we had pulled up to the, uh, to the area, to the parking area, and we weren't sure how long it was going to take us to find these guys because this is a vast, just plain of flat grass, tundra or whatever that has multiple rolling um, little ditches and stuff like that. And before we got out of the car, Lee J says, I got him. And these two things are about a half mile away, straight into the sun. And Lee J's like, yep, there they are. So we get out, put the scopes up and sure enough, there they were. Then we continued on um, where we had been tipped off. There was a deer falcon nest and um, Derek, needed deer falcon. So we were hoping to get them. And then we lucked out because we got, we found their nest and we can see their little babies 
piled up in the nest. And then we also saw the adult. Um, so the adult passed by, um, both adults actually, passed by as we were there. Um, so junior falcons are cool because they're the largest falcon species in the world. Um, and they, they breed way up north in the tundra and they're primarily hunting ptarmigan and other bird species. So the rock ptarmigan and the willow ptarmigan that we had seen, that's what they're primarily eating every day. And then, um, so while we were, we were looking at the nest, the adults weren't on the nest, um, but we were scanning around hoping to get the, the adult deer falcons. And then I actually managed to spot this guy, or not sure if it's the male or female, but it was across the river and like up the side of a mountain. And I just happened to be scanning and spotted it. So that was fortuitous. Um, and then as you saw that photo, it did actually fly by at one point. And then here, this slide is just showing you um, kind of what it looks like at higher elevation tundra. So very rocky, the plants are very low lying. It was actually um, a lot nicer to walk around because um, it's not very, it's not shrubby at all. Um, and then here, there were little tundra, beautiful little tundra flowers that were sprouting. Um, so here's just a closer view of like this little guy right there. And then we were, um, so this is a, an example of a semi-palmated plover up in that same area. So just demonstrating very rocky and then small low-lying plants, but lots of flowers at this time of the year. And then we were here for Northern Wheat Ear. Um, we did managed to get a glimpse of one at a, a, a previous site, but I wasn't able to get a good photo. So I wanted a photo of Northern Wheat Ear. Um, so we went up to this spot. We're high up in the, in the kind of mountainous area. Um, so here, Derek and I are, we're scanning, we're listening for Northern Wheat Ear. Um, eventually we gave up. Derek and Lee J started eating lunch. And then Derek claims that he heard the Northern Wheat Ear singing first, but I heard it at the same time. Um, but then it was, we found the northern wheat ear and I went off and took pictures of it. Um, and this was um, like a priority species for us because um, northern wheat ears ve have very cool ecology where most of the northern wheat ears are found breeding across Europe and parts of Asia, but then a subset are, are um, found in, in rocky areas of the tundra of North America. Um, and then in the winter, literally all of the world's northern wheat ears will migrate and reconvene in just two areas of Africa. So the northern wheat ears that breed in Alaska will migrate roughly 9,300 miles, flying westward towards Siberia and then diagonally across Asia to end up in eastern Africa. So all of the birds that we, all of the northern wheat ears that we saw spend the winter in Africa and all the all the northern wheat ears in the world spend um, their winter in Africa. So that's a pretty incredible migration story of this of this bird. Yeah, it's really interesting to see um, how many m different migration patterns you get when you when you see the birds up in Alaska. Like we just saw that blue throat that's that's not too distantly related to this northern wheat ear. So he'll come to Nome and he'll head you know, west and go down into, you know, Southeast Asia and in Australia. And then this guy who's breeding, you know, just up the slope from the blue throats will head all the way across Canada, across the Atlantic Ocean and end up in Africa. So it's, it's quite amazing that these, you know, species all ended up uh, in Alaska in this small area and diverge so differently whenever they, whenever they leave. And here's just a video of the northern wheat ear singing. So yeah, just a cute little chattery song. And then this is my picture of it um, that I was seeking. So we left there happy. We stopped back by the deer falcon nest and then the one of the deer falcons was actually on the nest. Um, so that's just these photos. We also stopped back by the emperor geese and they were slightly closer, um, as you can see from these photos. 
So got a little bit of a better look at them. And then at the same site, um, I just saw a semi-palmated plover, took a picture of that as well. And then um, something neat that we were seeing were tundra swans in the tundra. So here in West Virginia, we get you know a bunch of tundra swans passing through in the winter, um, but it was cool to see them up on their breeding grounds, which is why they were named tundra swan. Yeah, and safety sound here is, this is just a small glimpse of safety sound. It is miles uh, along the safety sound lagoon. So there were hundreds of these tundra swans. Just, you can see most of them are paired up, um, just doing their little feeding before they um, keep on their journey and get to their actual breeding spots. And then um, I had mentioned Cape Nome, which is that little kind of corner that um, juts out a little bit into the water. And there was a brambling just hanging out nearby um, that area. And so brambling is just, it's worth mentioning because it's um, somewhat of a rarity. Um, so it's a finch that's usually found in Europe and Asia, but they'll appear in small numbers in Alaska during migration. Um, and Derek was the only one of us to actually get a photo of the brambling. We were hearing it singing, but often it was not perched up the way it is in this photo. So it was, he was difficult to, to see. Um, and then I took a picture of a yellow warbler male that was at the same site. And so that was my best photo from that location. And then we saw a muskox on the way back. Um, and then just to point out that both male and female muskoxen have horns, um, but the males are gonna be larger and heavier. So here we have a female up here, a male down here. And then here we have a female and a male next to each other. And you can see that difference in the horns. Um, so if you wanted, if you wanted to tell the sex of muskox, that's how you would tell. And then we have just a little video of of the herd. Um, here we have a little calf following its mom. So there were um, a lot of calves actually that we saw. So we we came at the right time of year. And then you can see. Um, there's a, a second calf here that has actually a, a collar on it. Um, and so that's a tracking collar that researchers put on that calf to study um, calf mortality, which is how and why they die. So hopefully that little calf did not die, but <laughs> that's why the collar is there. But yeah, just a cute little scene of the herd. And then our last, I think our last stop was um, along the coast where Derek wanted to look for flyby Arctic loons. Um, there were not that many that were flying by and there were no, none of them were Arctic loons. Um, so I got a little bored <laughs> and I just, I wandered off down the beach um, and I found this pair of redneck phalaropes just along the water's edge, along with their little buddy, a Lapland longspur. So like it, we had we already covered lapid long spurs, but they were everywhere, literally everywhere. And here I just I I spent most of the time during that watch just photographing these redneck phala ropes, because um, I thought that was more interesting than hoping for a non-existent arctic loon. So yeah, just lots of lots of pretty photos of the phala ropes. Okay, so our final day in Nome, um, we only had basically the morning before our flight left in the afternoon, so we were still missing some species that we hope to get or get better looks at, and one of the things that you uh, will spend a lot of time doing on Nome is uh, just doing sea watches. So we headed back down to Cape Nome, which has a nice little place to do a sea watch. On the way, we did see more muskox, and I did insist that we stop and photograph them. So here we just have, um, so this is the gnome herd. Um, so we had previously shown the, tel the herd that lives near Teller, and then this is the herd that lives near gnome. Um, and so we have a mom and her baby. And I could not get enough videos or photos of muskox, and um, yeah, Derek was insistent that I had enough. <laughs> But look at this cute little calf and his mom. This was probably the youngest calf that we saw. He looks pretty young compared to the um, the other ones that we saw in the video. So 
he's uh, probably just a few weeks yeah. old. And then this is um, this is Cape Nome, which we had mentioned a couple of times. This is where we're doing our sea watch. And we saw some harbor porpoises. So there's at least two or three here. So yeah, so that was cool. Okay, and then while <clears throat> Hannah was looking for porpoises, I was spending the time with the scope looking about a mile off into the distance at these um, just large flocks of white wing scoters. And the reason that we're trying um, to spend so much time looking at white wing scoters is because there's, there's three different populations of white wing scoters. And Nome in this coast of Alaska is about the only place that you can uh, see one that was recently split. And it's called the Steinager's scoter. And they look almost exactly the same as these white wing scoters. You can see here, um, this top bird is a white wing scoter and the bottom bird is, a, is the Steinager scoter. Um, and these birds are bouncing up and down on the waves and you're looking through heat, shimmer and haze. So it took us several hours of watching these to finally pinpoint the difference between a uh, white winged scoter here um, that you can see. It's got a more rounded head doesn't have the knobby bill um, of the Steininger scoter, um, which has a knobby bill, a more blocky type of head. And if you were close enough, um, like some lucky people, you can see that the color of the bill is, is kind of inverted between white wing scoter and Steininger scoter. So the Steininger scoter looks very colorful because you have um, like the deeper red up here and the, and the gold, golden yellow or orange along the, uh, the cutting edge, whereas it's kind of reversed in, in uh, white wing scoters. We see more orange on the top of the bill and that deeper uh, ruby color um, on the edge. And this is Lee Jay and Hannah trying to uh, pick them out. And the birds are like way over here. Um, so just, just takes a lot of patience um, and uh, dedication to, to finally pick them out, but we did. Um, so that was good. Yep. And then that's the end of Gnome. Here we have a big male muskox that was just browsing right in town. Um, they were just all around. All right, so from Gnome, we went to Utgavik. So here we are in Gnome, Gnome being right here. So if we zoom out and then zoom back into Alaska. So this, this is the Gnome cluster, and then all the way up here is Utgavik. So zooming in is this cluster. We're up high. And then here we have um, the town and then the places that we went in Utgavik. And so here, just to contrast, it was very snowy. Um, a lot of gnome, the snow had already melted, but here there was definitely still snow on the ground. Yeah, it was, um, it seemed to be a, a late spring in um, Utgavik. Um, so lots of the, the potholes that you see for the ducks and stuff were still covered, but there was still enough for us to, um, to see. In uh, the native and in, in Unipak language, um, Utkivik means the place where we hunt snowy owls. So um, Utkivik is actually one of the, of the oldest consistently habited um, towns or villages in uh, the United States. It's the northernmost point in the U.S. and the, the Barrow Spit is what they call it, um, is, is pretty much the dividing line of the Arctic Ocean between the Chukchi and the Beaufort Seas. Um, whereas Nome, the, um, the town was basically founded um, for gold. Um, this one is supported largely right now by oil and petroleum. In fact, the, um, the entire uh, Utkivik area is surrounded by the, uh, the U.S. Uh, Petroleum Reserve, um, and we drove through several oil fields. Um, that's the main source of income for, for most of the workers. Surprisingly, Utkivik, even though it's so far north, actually has more people than uh, Nome. Uh, it's about 5,000 in population, so closer uh, in size to Kaiser. And I would say the other uh, reason some of you may know Utkivik, which was formerly called Barrow, Alaska, um, is that um, 
many years ago when, when aviation explorers were new, um, Wiley Post and uh, Will Rogers, a, a well-known American humorist, uh, were just uh, 10 miles south of, of Barrow here at the time, and their plane crashed, um, killing both of them. And that's why the, uh, the airport that we landed at here in Utkivik uh, is actually named Wiley Post and Will Rogers for, uh, for the death of those. And there's a small memorial um, that we saw near the whale bones. So as Hannah showed you in the, uh, in the flyby, and one of the concerns uh, in climate change for the Arctic is the sea ice and pack ice. So you can still see that there was a good amount of uh, pack ice flow right along the coast. Um, and then still lots of snow on the, uh, on the ground in the areas. And the pack ice is actually very important for the local people um, to do their hunting of whales and also for um, the health of polar bears, enabling them the, to hunt the seals. So um, the native people um, are allowed to harvest whales, as is their tradition. And you can see um, the very famous whalebone arch, and you can see some uh, whale skulls here. And these are all bowhead whale uh, skulls. And we saw them right along the beach or where they've piled up um, these berms to, to help prevent erosion. Um, and you can see Lee Jay and Hannah in front of the, uh, uh, the famous whalebone arch. Um, when we landed in uh, Utkivik, uh, after we got checked into the hotel and uh, finally got our rental car, um, recent reports had shown that there was a, a redneck stint um, reported in the gravel pits. So we uh, dropped off the stuff and headed immediately over to these uh, gravel pits uh, to try to look for a redneck stint, which is one of the more rare species that we saw. It's a, usually an Asian bird. So um, in the gravel pits, there were a bunch of, a bunch of little shorebirds just running around. Um, and it was a little bit difficult to pick out the redneck stint. So we were searching for one bird among 100? 100 birds or 100 so, birds. yeah, small shorebirds. Um, so we did get tripped up. We first saw um, this little guy across the water. We thought it was it because it had a very rufous neck. But then we realized, oh, that's just a sanderling. Um, and part of that confusion is in the winter, our sanderlings are just gray and white and very plain. Um, but in their summer breeding plumage, they get actually quite colorful. Um, so we did we did get tripped up a little bit, but then um, but then we finally spotted him, and this is him across the water. And then eventually he did get closer, and then it was kind of funny because I was I was looking at one at a redneck stint, and then Derek is looking in like ninety degree opposite direction, and he's like, "I got it," and I was like, "No, I got it," <laughs> and it turned out there were two. Um, so the second one had been previously unreported. So we we found the second redneck stint. Um, and then, like um, Derek said, redneck stints are cool because they're mostly found in Asia and Australia. And then a small number of indi individuals show up in Alaska pretty much every year. Um, and they're usually associated with other sandpiper species um, when they when they do show up. And then also at that gravel pit, there was uh, there were two sab Sabines, Sabine Sabins. skull. Um, they're really pretty. Yeah, one of the high Arctic gulls that um, you know, along with like uh, Ross's gull or ivory gull that um, that are commonly found up here. One of the small gulls, uh, also the same species that randomly showed up at uh, Prickett's Fort a few years ago. And then also at the gravel pits. Um, were a little group of red knots, um, and that was just cool, and I got a video of them um, because there are, there are two subspecies of red knot, and the subspecies that we're most familiar with in West Virginia and along the East Coast is the eastern subspecies um, that are, are famous and known for their long migration. They congregate in Delaware during their migratory stopover, um, but these guys were not them. They are the western subspecies, so it's cool to see a new subspecies of red knot. And then um, we kind of divide up the birds that we saw by those that were in and around town and those that weren't. So of the birds in and around town, we saw hoary red poles, um, most of them by the airport. And we did spend a lot of time by the airport for 
<laughs> reasons we can explain later. Um, but I spent most of that time out photographing Cory Red Poles that were just in the around the airport parking lot. And then this should be a familiar face. This is the Lapland long spur that we um, that were uh, everywhere in Nome, and then they were also here in Utkivik. Yeah, so while Lee J and Derek are waiting and guarding the luggage in the airport, Hannah's out photographing birds. Just wanted to make that clear. Um, there are also a lot of snow buntings in Utgivik. So here we're going to play a video of him singing. And snow buntings, they were, they were everywhere. They were probably the most common songbird that we're seeing. If you think about it, if you want to relate it to like an eastern bird, they were as common as house birds are here. Um, they were just in people's backyards, on people's houses. So um, here I have a collage of all the pictures I took of snow buntings. I took a lot because they were everywhere and I liked them. <laughs> Here's some more photos. Um, you can see they're literally just on the buildings. They're on trash just around the, the town, on the ground. They were everywhere. Also everywhere were greater white-fronted geese. So here's just a fun little video of one scratching and stretching. Um, and they were probably the most common bird in Utgivik. Um, even more common than the snow buntings. There was pretty much a pair of white-fronted geese in like every yard that we saw and out in the out in the tundra. So here's just more photos of them. They were very common. Um, like I said, just everywhere they were paired up. Um, so here we have a little pair together, um, but they were everywhere. They were also in the um, like area by the parking lot of the airport. <laughs> so I did take lots of photos of them. Um, also in the parking lot area were um, some semi-palmated sandpipers and these guys were were pretty much everywhere in like little small puddles of water around town so like in people's backyards um, just in any little wet area. And then in slightly bigger wet areas like more um, small pond type areas we got a uh, red-necked fowl rope. So these are the guys that I had seen down in Nome. And then we got red fowl ropes. And so this was one of our target species. Um, you can see the difference. They're mostly red. They have that black on the top of their head and a white kind of mask on their face. Um, but they were they were one of our target species. Um, we only saw them in Utkirvik. Um, as a fun fact about red fowl ropes and fowl ropes in general, um, just as a quick little quiz, how many females do you think are pictured on this slide? And just kind of think the number because we're not going to have you unmute or anything. Um, but if you thought two females, then you're correct. If you thought two males, you were incorrect. And that's because for fowl rope species, females are actually the flashy, um, boldly colored, boldly patterned species. So here, this guy is actually the male. And then this is the female, these two, um, where you can see they're, they have darker caps, their, their red is a bit brighter than the male. And so the, it's, it's a subtle difference, um, but females are, are the prettier, um, more kind of attention catching sex, um, which is unusual with birds because most, most, most species for birds, the male is the flashier, um, more colorful sex. So that's an interesting fact about fowl ropes. Then here we have a female on the left, male on the right. And then here is a video um, of their feeding behavior. Yeah, so this is this is really classic fowl rope feeding behavior. Um, you'll see them do this whether you're on the side of a road and they're in like two inches of water or you're out in the middle of the ocean on a pelagic and you see these guys. They spin around and they hope that the um, the upward flow of the uh, of the spinning creates a little vortex that allows the little uh, microinvertebrates that um, they like to eat come up to the uh, surface of the water where they can eat them. 
And then birds that were primarily found outside of town, some of the larger bodied water birds. So we saw tundra swans, um, so tundra swans in the tundra, which was fun. Um, we saw a bunch of long-tailed ducks. Um, some of them were closer to town, some of them were further away. Um, but we have here, we have a male and a female, and this is breeding plumage for them. And then the reason they're called long-tailed ducks is illustrated nicely in this photo. So you can see these two very long tail feathers that stick out from the male. So that's where they got their name, long-tailed ducks. Um, we also saw Stellar's eider, which was one of our target species. So um, Stellar's eider is probably the most common nesting duck in Utgevik. Um, and um, interestingly, just a fun fact, breeding success for Stellar's eiders is related to the abundance of lemmings, um, which seems odd because lemmings, they're not going to predate on, on the Stellar's eiders. So what, what is the connection there? And it's actually um, that there's another bird species that we'll, we'll cover called um, Jaegers, and they are nest predators, but they also eat lemmings. So when there's a lot of lemmings, they're gonna eat the lemmings. If there aren't many lemmings, they're gonna go after nests. Um, and we'll, we'll go over the Jaegers in a little bit. Um, so yeah, so Stilly's Eider, one of our targets. Um, a second target, also an eider, was the spectacled eider. Um, we didn't we didn't get as good of looks at the spectacled spectacled eider. There were fewer of them, and they were pretty distant, um, as you can tell by my my poor photos over here. But here's a really a really quick little video. Um, you can see there's like heat shimmer and distance going on, so not great looks. But um, we do have to see them in Alaska or Russia, but in North America, Alaska. Um, and they spend the, the, middle, the winter in the middle of the Bering Sea, floating in gaps in the sea ice. Um, so that's cool natural history fact about spectacled eiders. Yeah, one of the reasons that we didn't see too many spectacled eiders is, um, as you guys saw in the photo that uh, Hannah took out the window, like a lot of the out of town, like small little ponds, still hadn't um, thawed yet. So we saw a few groups near the Dump Marsh and a few groups on Cake Eater Road. These guys were just arriving as we were here. So it's kind of a balancing act of when you try to visit um, some of these places to maximize your species if you were um, like a first time visitor like we were. We saw more of them moving um, offshore, like out over the sea ice, kind of waiting for these little um, areas to thaw enough where they could they can come and establish their territories. And then we also saw King Eider, um, which I don't think was a lifer for anyone, but it was my first time seeing like an adult breeding male King Eider. Um, so I took a lot of vote, uh, video videos and photos. So here's one of those videos of just a, a group of King Eiders. Um, so here we have the males very brightly colored, ornamented, and then the females are these kind of plain dark brown birds that are hanging out with the males. And pair bonds are established um, either before or during spring migration, and then males stay with their mate until she lays the eggs. So here we all the most of the king eiders were paired up um, at this point. So more photos of the king eider because they were really pretty and they were closer usually than the other eiders, so got more photo opportunities. Um, and then to round out our eider species, um, the fourth eider species is the common eider. Um, they, we, common eiders we can see on the east coast, um, out on the ocean, um, but it was nice seeing them in Alaska and getting all four eider species. And then we did um, do a couple of little sea watches for loons that were flying by. Um, here we have a yellow-billed loon, so you, you can see the contrast of my photo of it, and then the, here's Derek's photo. And then here are the Jaegers. Um, so I, I, I talked about them when I was talking about Stellar's Eiders. Um, and so there's three species of Jaeger. There's the Pomerine, Parasitic, and Long-tailed. Um, and all three of these are, are meat eaters. So their summer diet is mostly small rodents, especially lemmings and voles. Um, but they will also eat insects. They'll eat birds. Um, so they kind of take the place. They are the predator. Um, bird species out on the tundra. 
Um, and then they'll eat a, a variety of other things. Um, but they are a threat. They are a threat to like duck species um, and like nesting species out on the tundra. And then last species um, that will bird species we'll go over is the pectoral sandpiper. So we were, we were seeing like a couple sand sandpiper species out out of town. One of the one of them being the pectoral. And then we saw a polar bear, and this was probably one of the highlights of my of the trip for me. Um, maybe not for non for more birdie people, but um, I was really excited to see this this male polar bear stroll by. So here we have a video of him that I took. Um, so polar bears, I mean, most people already know them, but they are the largest bear, the largest carnivorous land mammal in the world. Um, they reach up to eight feet long from nose to tail. And um, something sad about them is that they are threatened under the Endangered Species Act, the US Endangered Species Act, um, mostly because global climate change is resulting in the loss of their sea ice habitat, which Derek had mentioned earlier. So it was um, very nice and an honor to see a polar bear in the wild. Yeah, and what you'll see this polar bear doing is he's eating, and he's eating um, slabs of, blu of blubber, whale blubber. So like we talked about earlier, we showed you the pictures of the skulls, um, the native peoples um, will go out, harvest a bowhead whale, uh, bring it back to, to process to divide up the meat, the blubber, stuff like that um, for the whole town to use. And it's, it's somewhat dangerous when you have these, these massive carnivores um, just off, you know, off your town and you have big chunks of carcass, you know, right at the beach. So what they'll do is they'll um, take some of these uh, gut piles and blubber piles and stuff like that and leave them well out of the sea ice for uh, the bears to eat. And this is just a little context of, of how close or how far we were. We weren't really weren't in any danger. Yeah, so we were, we were quite far away. This, this picture up here is zoomed in. So we're even further than this. Um, so these, these photos are obviously very zoomed in and so is the video. Um, but you can see fog kind of rolled in um, while we were viewing the polar bear. And so um, after I think like a, a, a solid 30 seconds in the freezing cold, um, we finally left when the fog. Minutes. Yeah, 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, and then that's the end of Utgivik. So our next destination was Seward. So here we are going from um, Utgivik, which is at the very top of Alaska. So up here all the way down to Seward, um, which is down here. So zooming into that area, here we have Anchorage and then Seward is directly south um, and right by the Kenai Fjords National Park. So here, just some more uh, photos from the plain of the snowy mountains of Alaska. Right, so um, Seward and Kenai Fjords, um, due to some uh, plain difficulties uh, from Barrow, from Utkivik, um, we got to uh, Seward off schedule. Um, Seward's mostly a tourist town um, known for the gateway to Kenai Fjords. Um, people taking boat tours out to see the glaciers and stuff like that. But for birders, um, it's probably the most easily accessible place to see uh, some of the birds that we'll show you um, next, uh, although not well. Um, it's a small town, like I said, 2,600 people, and again, thrives mostly on, on tourism. So I wanted to include this picture because the first bird we saw during that day of our boat tour was a rock pigeon just on the boat docks. And this is probably as good as the weather is going to get, so don't get your hopes up. Um, so a lot of what we saw were, were actually marine mammals, including a sea otter. Um, so we saw plenty of sea otters. Um, just a fun little story about the uh, sea otters is we were actually in Nome one morning eating breakfast and we overheard this this guy talking to another guy and he was like did you know that sea otters have a million um, hairs per square inch and we we're like well that sounds made up like that cannot be like we just assumed he was exaggerating and then later when we actually had wi-fi we looked it up and it turns out it's true um, so sea otter fur contains between 600,000 to a million hair follicles 
per square inch. So they, they do actually have the thickest fur of any animal. Um, and that came as a, as a surprise for us. Um, but yeah, that's pretty insane. And their, their hair is so dense it, because they don't have blubber the way you think like seals have blubber and that keeps them warm. Um, sea otters ref, rely on their fur to keep them warm. And then um, in addition to sea otters, we saw humpback whales. Um, here we have a video. Um, so here there's the whale right there. So it's kind of hanging out along the surface. Um, and then she'll she'll pop back up over here, right here. There, the tail stuck in the air. Um, and then keep your eyes on the water um, because something cool happens. Yeah, so that was the calf um, just breaching. And we think it was for fun. Um, it was just playing around. Um, so here we have a photo of an adult over here, and then here's that calf. And it was just kind of continually breaching um, and like just putting on a show. So that was cool. Um, just some, here's just some of the scenery. It was very pretty, except for the fact that it was raining and windy and the water was very choppy once you got out, out of the, the heart or out of the, bay, yeah. the bay area. <laughs> Um, but we did see wildlife, so that was nice. We saw some mountain goats on the side of, of one of the, like, mountains. Um, we saw stellar sea lion. We saw orcas. Um, and then, of course, we saw the glaciers, because that was, I guess, one of the main highlights of the boat tour we were on. Um, so notice how, how blue the ice looks, especially in, like, kind of the cracks and crevices. And so that was uh, because as we learned, um, glacier ice is blue because the red part of white light has the longest wavelengths and is absorbed by the ice. But the blue light, which has very short wavelengths, is transmitted and scattered by the ice. So um, the color that we see then is blue. And that's true of, of all the glacier ice, um, especially when it gets deep in there. And then this is just a video of um, just a little bit of a calving event. Um, and then you can actually see there's some like kayakers over here um, in the water, just observing. So yeah, we saw glaciers. Um, in the sea ice, there were harbor seals. So here we have a kind of zoomed out picture of them. And then here we zoom in. So um, there were quite a few calves or, or pups, seal pups. Um, so here's a mom and her pup just hanging out on the little sea ice. Um, there were a lot of waterfalls. It was a very pretty area. Lots of waterfalls, more waterfalls. <laughs> um, and then some of the waterfalls had mountain goats. So here we have, you know, an adult mountain goat and then a little baby mountain goat. Right, and then after we, uh got away from the glaciers and everybody went inside uh, because most people were not birders here. Um, we finally got to see some of the uh, some of the birds that we came after. So the boat that we were on was a, a big tour boat and in their defense, um, like the bird species that we were after and stuff like that was not the main focus of the tour. Unfortunately, our bird focus tour got canceled um, because we were stuck in Utkavik based on plane issues. But the, one of the biggest reasons that people go to Seward and go out on these little mini pelagics is to see this bird up here, which is a Kitlitz's murrelet. And this was the only photo that I got, and I might have been the only person on this boat to have seen these. This was taken at 300 yards with the boat moving, I don't know, at 15 miles an hour in the wind and rain, and the captain would not stop because we had to go to see a glacier even though she kept pointing out birds that were not Kitlitz's Murrelets at all. They were rhino ocklets or harlequin ducks and stuff like that. But we did get close enough where um, at some of the stops where we were looking at mountain goats and other stuff that happened to have uh, some puffins and some other seabirds on here. So this was a horned puffin, which was my last puffin that I needed to see. Um, a nice little view here. And then tufted puffins here. Uh, you can see the pair of them, and you can see how they uh, they get their name from the from the tufts. 
Um, one of the other um, big um, bird groups that we saw on the on the rocky islands and stuff like that were were MERS. Um, and you can easily see the gull species here um, that nest with the MERS are, are black-legged kittiwakes. But if you look at these uh, groups of MERS, there's actually both species of MERS here. There's there's common MERS, which are um, more chocolatey brown and have a longer, uh, thinner bill than these thick-billed MERS, which are pretty much jet black, have a thicker bill, and usually on the breeding uh, males, you can see a, a white gape line here. And then we headed back. Um, we did not get much dedicated time to birds, but it is well. what it is. <laughs> Uh, so we headed back. These are just some of the mountains surrounding Resurrection Bay on the way to Seward. And then that is the end of Seward. Um, here's some sea otters. <laughs> All right, so from Seward, we our next stop is the Denali Highway. So we're going from Seward, so zooming out again, here's Seward, here's Anchorage up here. And then, so Seward, Anchorage, and the Denali Highway is this little cluster of, of three um, Ebert hotspots. So zooming back in, so it's these three right here. And then now you can actually see the road. So it goes from Paxton from um, on the east, and then it follows the road all the way to Cantwell over here on the west. Um, but before we got to the Denali Highway, we did make a stop on the way from Seward to Anchorage um, right here, which is Turn Lake. And here we picked up a lifer for me. Um, there are actually, there are three duck species in this photo. There's tufted duck, greater scop, and ringneck duck. And I was after the tufted duck. And um, you probably can see the duck that has a tuft right here. And so that was my life for tufter, tufted duck. And then um, we made a couple other stops on the way to Denali Highway. So we made um, just a couple of stops. The first of those. So this is um, just looking out at Gunsight Mountain. Um, for bird people, Gunsight Mountain is famous because they established a hawk watch. Um, that has more golden eagles and more Harlan's hawks than anywhere else uh, in North America that pass through. And then the second place we stopped was um, just a random kind of boat ramp, um, Tulsona Lake boat ramp. And there was a lake and there were a lot of waterfowl. So here we have Barrow's golden eye, bufflehead, white winged scoter, and Bonaparte's gull. Um, and the Barrow's golden eye were putting on a good little show. Um, and it was nice to get better photos of those. And then our, our main target, the reason we stopped there was um, for Bohemian Waxwing. Right, so uh, in West Virginia, we have uh, cedar waxwings. Um, and up north, um, you have Bohemian Waxwings. You can notice that the, um, uh, the, the crest on the head is, is longer, the plumes are longer. You have a rusty undertail here more white on the wings, um, just a, a very pretty bird, but different than the ones we see here as cedars. Yep. And here's a better picture by Derek. There were a lot of mosquitoes. <laughs> and this, these little dots are not my camera lens being um, dirty. These are mosquitoes and they were all around us as well. So the Denali Highway, um, as you saw from, from Hannah's map there, runs east to west between Paxton and Cantwell. And this was actually the first road to uh, the National Park. So if you saw where Anchorage was, Denali is pretty much straight up from Anchorage. But in order to get to the park initially, you have to go you know, 130 miles to your east, probably another 70 miles north, and then 135 miles back, back west on this largely unpaved road. Um, and this is just pure wilderness. But there were a surprising number of um, fishing and hunting lodges along the route, and we actually stayed at, at one um, that was that was quite nice. But it was it was surprising how many um, how many places there were to to stop or eat just in the middle of nowhere here. And the the highway was a very scenic, um, like it was probably one of the prettiest roads that we drove um, for our entire trip. So lots of mountains. Um, more mountains, yeah, all the all the mountains. Um, very pretty, pretty landscape views. So more mountains. And then our, our main um, bird target for the Denali Highway was the Smith's Longspur. 
Um, so we went to one of the few remaining like reliable, accessible places to find Smith Longsburg. Um, so they used to be more more commonly found along the highway, but um, they've kind of petered out a little bit. And they're very skulky little bird. It took us it took us a good. It took a couple of hours to find <laughs> this bird for Hannah. Yeah. Um, and you can see how skulky they are. Um, so in this, the picture on the right, here he is in the grass. Um, finally, I got an open picture, but actually Derek got the best photo. Um, Derek was the one who, who originally found the bird. So Right. So while I was looking for the Smith's Longspur, <laughs> Hannah and Lee Jay were over there examining some type of caribou carcass or some type of... of bones or something deciding on what was a scapula what was a femur and stuff like that and i'm here trying to yell at them and get their attention while this little bird is <laughs> is singing mostly hidden in the grass and then we saw some more arctic warblers um so that was nice we got some nice photos of those good good views um derek got the best photo like this is a beautiful photo of an arctic warbler um, we saw some other birds. We saw bald eagle. We saw American tree sparrow. Um, we saw a trumpeter swan. So previously we had seen a bunch of tundra swans. This is a trumpeter swan, slightly bigger, sl slight differences from the, the tundra swan. Um, and here in this, in this um, larger picture, it's that little white speck that there is pointing to. Then we also saw mammals. So here we have a young um, caribou that we we spotted along the road. Um, and then we also encountered a moose and her calf just along the road. And then that is the end of Denali Highway. Yeah, I know it doesn't seem like we we stopped and took a lot of pictures of the birds and stuff like that. But people who go to Alaska for, for birding, mainland Alaska, like their favorite places to bird are either Nome just because of the variety or the Denali Highway um, because there's such variety of birds and there, there are so many birds. And uh, by this time, we had mostly seen most of our target birds. So we were moving along, uh, stopping, not doing uh, like serious eBird listing and stuff like that, just enjoying all the birds. But there were Arctic warblers everywhere along this route, and each little pond had a variety of ducks. So it's really a rich, rich birding area, um, and a road that was in much better condition than I anticipated. Like the first 25 miles were paved, and the gravel on the on the remaining road was, again, better than a lot of the roads around Morgantown. So if you go there, especially to Denali, highly recommend the highway for birding. And then our next and final big stop was Denali National Park. So here we are, here's Denali Highway stretching across. Um, so if we zoom out a little bit, so Denali Highway being those three eBird hotspots, and then Denali National Park is this cluster right here. So just zooming in. So here is Denali Mountain, um, and then here's the, on our way into the park. Yeah, it was formerly called uh, Mount McKinley after the president. Um, in Alaska, things are big, especially national parks. Um, Denali is by far not the biggest in the state, but it's larger than the entire state of New Hampshire. And there's really only a little bit of it that's accessible by vehicles. Um, interestingly enough, since it's uh, such a uh, widely visited park um, in the wintertime, um, they have a sled dog system for the rangers that actually go out and check on people who are uh, backcountry skiing or, or out in the park. And it's the only one in the uh, national park system. Yep. So obviously Denali being the namesake of the park. So here you can see Denali and then progressively closer views of Denali. And so um, Denali is the highest mountain peak in North America. The summit elevation is 2,000, oh sorry, not 2,000, 20,310 feet above sea level. So very tall, very high. Um, and it's the third most prominent and third most isolated peak on Earth, so across the entire planet. So very cool to see it. And we were actually lucky to see it because in the summer, visitors only have about a 30% chance of actually seeing the mountain um, because seven out of 10 days, the mountains are out of sight from cloud cover. Um, where you, you won't see the peak of Denali. 
Um, so lots of mountains, obviously, in the park. Um, we got all the way to Polychrome Mountain, and that's where we had to stop because there was a road closure. Um, there was a, a landslide. Or... Yeah, there's a massive landslide <laughs> on the uh, on the park system road that will probably not be repaired until like 2025, according to the um, um, the park rangers. Like the road's just gone. Like it completely <laughs> uh, slid away. So we were. Uh, there's one road system that goes into the park, and you can take it for about 90 miles, I think, on the trolleys. But um, currently, uh, you have to stop at Polychrome Pass, which is about um, 40 miles in or so. And then in terms of birds um, in Denali Park, again, we had seen a lot of birds at this point. Um, but in the parking lot, we got Canada Jay. So this is an adult Canada Jay. And then here's um, its juvenile um, so different plumage, but same species. Um, there were a lot of white crowned sparrows um, singing and and showing off. Um, there are a bunch of short billed gulls in the area, in the park and in the area. Um, and then we got three of the big five mammals that can be seen in the park. So first of those being doll sheep. So um, up on the on the slope, we saw a bunch of doll sheep. Here's a, a closer um, look at what they look like. We saw caribou. Um, they're the most common mammal, big mammal that we saw is caribou. Um, so they're the only member of the deer family that has, where both the males and females have antlers, um, but the males' antlers are more robust. So this is a male caribou trotting past our bus. So yeah, we saw caribou, they were grazing, they were walking around, they were um, walking around um, the snow, but yeah. But then we saw a third of the big five, which was moose. And we got to see baby moose, um, which I mean, we had seen before, but it's always exciting to see baby moose. Um, and this was right at like the park entrance. Um, so it actually got a little bit of a crowd there. Um, but here's a video of the mom and her baby. And there's actually a second baby so in the spring, moose cows give birth to one or two calves, and calves are able to stand and walk around within a day. Um, they'll weigh about 25 to 35 pounds. Um, and then by the fall, so in a couple of months from when this video is taken, so by now actually, um, the calves are going to be like 10 times the size they are in the video and weigh like 300 to 400 pounds. Um, and calves will, will hang out with their mom for about a year before they take off and disperse on their own. But yeah, very cool to see mom and her two calves. Um, and that's the end of Denali National Park. Here's some more little moose calf photos that I took. And then um, when we, as we were headed back to Anchorage, we did make one last stop um, right around here. And it was at Hatcher Pass. So very, very pretty mountain, mountainous area. Um, and here we got, on the way out, we got a hoary marmot. Um, so that was exciting to me because I like, I like mammals and like squirrels especially. Um, so hoary marmots are the largest members of the squirrel family in North America. And adult hoary marmots, which this is, um, they'll weigh about 10 pounds. So very, very large squirrel, ground squirrel. And so here, just some more pictures of the hoary marmot. Yep. And that... That was the uh, the last stop we were hoping for uh, white tailed ptarmigan for uh, Hannah, but she uh, missed it as a golden eagle flew over and uh, scared it back down into the into the crevices of the of the of the mountain peaks. Uh, uh, just a great trip overall. Um, we were, I mean, species wise, we were a little bit limited just because uh, we got stuck in Barrow, so we didn't get to do as much um, birding around Anchorage and other areas. And we were birding for lifers, uh, target birding, since um, most of us hadn't been to these places before. Uh, I ended up with 17 for North America. Hannah had 19, and I think Lee J had 22 for um, North America. So um, really just a, a great trip overall, in spite of the weather on the, on the like mini pelagic that we had to take. And then just to end things, if you would like to see more photos, I'm going to self-plug. Um, my public Facebook page, which is called All That Wildlife. 
So if you already follow the page, you probably have seen some of these photos, um, but I will be posting more. And I have I post um, bird and wildlife photos from all my travels. So um, if you're interested in seeing nice photographs of wildlife and learning some interesting facts, then check out my Facebook page. And then that is the end. Um, maybe there's some questions in the chat that we will look at. Um, so we are definitely happy to answer questions. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen so that we can look at the chat questions. Okay. All right. Let's go through these really quick. Okay, I think. Let's see. I probably missed it, what month of the year and what seasonal conditions they like. Um, yeah, so uh, we went in the first part of June. So um, the reason we went in the first part of June is because that's the best time to uh, maximize your chance for rarities coming in and arriving birds um, on the tundra. So we were there from early June until mid June. And in, in uh, Utkivik, um, it's above the Arctic Circle, so um, light was 24-7. Nome was just south of the Arctic Circle, so it's mostly light all the time. And Anchorage and Seward just basically had little bits of twilight for a couple hours in the morning. Okay, sorry, we're just, we're going through the questions in the chat. <laughs> um, uh, we are, we did, like I said, record this, so um, we'll post that on YouTube. And then... Yeah, so someone asked, how did we know what to look for and where? Um, uh, one of the good things about Alaska is that the places that we went have been visited by tour groups and stuff like that for years and years and years. And that info is has been kind of established and passed down. Ebird's another great spot um, for species that aren't mark sensitive. Um, but just knowing the habitat is, is another thing that, that you look for. Um, but all this information is, um, is available from, um, from previous uh, like trip reports and stuff like that. And if you have detailed questions, just send me an email and I'll be happy to answer, uh, give you uh, tips on where to go if you want to go, and especially logistics. Yeah, if there are any other questions, feel free to toss them in the chat. Um, we can also probably, um, if you want to ask your question in person, you can. we can unmute people if you want. Yeah, I think we can do that now. All right, well, um, if you do have questions or want to hang around, Derek and I will stick around for the next couple minutes, five, if, ten minutes. Yeah. Um, otherwise, um, Jane, do you have anything else you want to? Uh, no, thank you very much. That was really great. And uh, really, all the natural history that you added was wonderful. So I just want to thank you for sharing with us tonight. Lee J, anything you want to add? <laughs> you forgot to unmute. <laughs> okay, you guys did a very good job covering it all. all right, cool. So, like we said, we'll we'll stick around. Um, but otherwise, if you're here just for the meeting, feel free to go. Um, remember the January meeting, and um, remember to keep an eye out for Christmas bird count announcements. Sounds good. Thank you, guys. Thank you. It was really uh, quite an adventure. It makes us all want to go either back to Alaska or to Alaska for the first time. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Everybody should go see the high Arctic go uh, if they can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
And anyone who's um, sticking around, if you want to ask a question or, or I don't know, comment, um, feel free. We can unmute you. So just let us know in the chat um, right. or raise your hand in, in Zoom um, or just any indication and we'll unmute you. 